11 a.m. You had the game last week with Texas saying at a oh, and Louisiana. Think, yeah, what'd you think of the Aggies? They got a lot of work to do, man. Those guys, uh, you're not seeing the Aggie team that they wanted to field. That's for sure. That's true of a lot of teams right now, though. So you, you take the field and, and you're sitting there coming into the season. You're thinking, you know what? We're going to be pretty good here, here, and here. And we got question marks in this area or these areas. You know, those guys, right out of the gate, you, you rewind back to the UCLA game, which is you know painful memories for, for anybody that follows that program or has any affinity for it. But Nick Starkle goes down with that kind of weird foot injury. That's that the A plan was to be able to play a redshirt freshman. So it's never ideal. But you know, AM's constantly playing freshman and quarterback and trying to muscle their way towards the back end of the season. They start seasons great. Not this year. It just hadn't started that great. You lose Starkle, you got to play now a true freshman and quarterback. Their offensive line has been a jumbled up mess. And that was the problem versus Louisiana. They got to get that figured out. They've got a good line coach in Jim Turner. They've got some guys that seemingly they performed well a season ago. They lost both their tackles, and ever since then, they have been monkeying around with who's playing where. I think they've had three different left tackles. They'll probably have a fourth different one this this uh, coming matchup versus Arkansas. Um, but they haven't been able to get anything going offensively. It's been big plays. You know, Travion Williams is an unbelievable talent at the running back position. He didn't play versus Louisiana. I'm not sure that that even mattered that much, even though he's a game breaker. They they really struggled. Uh, versus the raging Cajun defensive line, and they hemorrhaged yards uh, the week before uh, versus Tulsa. So you're just looking at them, and you're going, guys, uh, they got to get that figured out offensively for sure. Help a true freshman quarterback out and a bunch of new faces at wide receiver. They have Christian Kirk, Travion Williams, and then either a true freshman or a bunch of question marks. And that's not what you want your offensive lineup to look like. And defensively, you know, you lose Miles Garrett, you lose Deshaun Hall, you lose Justin Evans. Those are three game-changing type, type guys, two of them on your front line, one in your back end at safety. And uh, John Chavis has had to kind of stand on his head. He's back on the sideline. That's something that he doesn't usually do as, as a defensive coordinator. He's always in the box. Well, he's on the sideline this year. And he said part of it is because i got to be able to look these guys in the eye. i got a bunch of kids that had not played football before. I mean, at this level – I have to be able to look at them and be like, can you handle what it is that we're doing? I don't need to hear about it through the headsets. I need to be able to look at you and know, you know, this guy's wide-eyed. I can't call that again. He doesn't know what's going on or he can't make adjustments in game. And it's compromised them. I mean, uh, Louisiana was able to move the football on them. Uh, so this is an interesting matchup. It'll be a very interesting matchup for both programs. There's no question, especially given where we are in the season and the question marks surrounding the program, the difficulties. You know, there's questions surrounding the head coaches, ballots or otherwise. Um, and the teams have, at least from a fan base perspective and expectation standpoint, they've underperformed. So who is going to get, you know, who's going to win out on this rubber match? Because right now, you know, you're looking at them. Um, there's a lot to be gained for the winner of this football game because it's not going to get any easier. You got to get a win. Yeah, and it seems like whoever loses, it just really is going to be difficult for Arkansas. That would be it'd be difficult to have a great season for A and M. It would look like it's going to be difficult for Kevin Sumlin to keep his job if they lose this game. Yeah, and I'm listening to you talk about A and M, and I'm I'm thinking to myself a couple of things. One. How does a team who's recruited around 12th in the country the last four years have these problems? And two, it sounds a little bit like what Arkansas is dealing with. And three, it sounds like what a lot of college football deals with. And how do you sort it all out? Because everybody sits around like we are right now and they analyze it and they're like, hey, that coach should have done this and this coach should have done that. And, you know, they're all on the <laughs> chopping block if you're yeah. not winning a lot. And and Arkansas and A&M are a little bit of a snapshot this weekend in, in, in that conversation it, it is you know it's a race from the bottom from a perspective standpoint that's what a lot of people i think are looking at the sec right now and we're going golly you know what's going on in auburn right now and all of it's relative to what guys like me and you spend the other eight months out of the year trumping up these programs and talking about what the expectations are and then you come out of spring ball and you look at summer camp a little bit and everybody gets winded up you know it's, it's like at this point we're all going to be Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks. We're all going to win the conference, and it just doesn't work that way. So Auburn right now, man, they're on the ropes, aren't they? How are they going to rally? Auburn was in the same situation last year. I mean, do we not remember this? The way they came out of the gate, and everybody's going, man, Auburn's got it. And they ended up beating LSU, and then they go to the Sugar Bowl. Now, they didn't play well in the Sugar Bowl. But the thing of it is is that that was a team that's on the outside looking in for a division championship. And at the beginning of the year, they're talking about the coach. Well, they're talking about the coach again. You know, and they're talking about the coach in Missouri. And they're talking about the coach here in Arkansas. And they're talking about the coach at Texas A&M. I mean, is, is the entire conference, is, is half of the conference 
going to have new, they're talking about the coach at Tennessee. And the question is, is that, you know, we're three weeks into the season. There's a lot of ball left to be played. And people get sick of hearing that. It's still true. I mean, you're going to play 10 more games in Arkansas. Guaranteed, you're going to play 10 more games. Now, how those look, you know, I think it really does hinge a lot on what's going to happen this week in Arlington. I mean, and, and that is from a mentality standpoint as much as anything else. As much as what you're looking for as far as the field of play, it's the mentality in that locker room. It's hard to insulate guys from the negativity around a program, and especially now, I don't know how coaches do it. They can't. I mean, they really can't. You know, the social media, all of it, it just it pierces that locker room easily. It's in, it's in their pockets, right? And my players are hearing all the negativity. They can choose to not listen to it, but that's not an easy thing to accomplish. That's what makes Saturday so important. It's not the rivalry piece. It's not necessarily the West Division or any of that stuff. It's every game after Saturday for both of these programs because in their minds, I know that those kids got to be wondering, what kind of year are we looking at now? And the thing is, it's not over. We're not even close to halfway over with this thing. We're not a quarter of the way through the season. What would you take away from Arkansas's game against TCU? What what did you leave uh, that result thinking? Well, obviously it's a disappointing performance for a lot of different reasons um you know it's nothing that hasn't already been observed you know you look at some of the guys the reps that guys got especially at some key spots like running back and you're wondering uh you know obviously tcu tcu does an excellent job with some of the pressure packages you know they're relatively exotic people come and they sit at the knee of gary patterson in the offseason for a reason and it's not because the guy plays vanilla i mean he understands how he can manipulate their defensive schemes to leverage what is you know lesser talent I mean, nobody's going to sit there and say, man, I'll tell you what, TCU, when they get off the bus, I get nervous. No. But when you turn on the film, you do. Um, and so you see a guy like, you know, Chase Hayden, who doesn't get the reps that you otherwise would have thought. I think he played in the third series of the game and then just didn't get back in the ball game. There's reasons for that. You know, there's more to the running back position than just being a ball carrier. And they get that. And they also understand that the most important position on the field is the quarterback spot. So you got to make sure that this guy, as a passer, and Austin Allen's not compromised, because of a threat that we want as a ball carrier in the game. At the same time, you don't want to take one of your best off, uh, weapons and an emerging offensive threat out of the game plan because of it. Um, so the idea that I think that Hayden didn't get or wasn't as involved in the game plan um, was curious. And I think even the coaches, I, I, I'm sure uh, it's more than acknowledged after the game. They're going, wow, you know, th- this, was a, this is a bullet that we never really got a chance to fire. Um, that's got to change. You know, the, everybody knew coming into the season, for Arkansas, and it's not that dissimilar from A&M, frankly. You know, outside of the Cornelius kid, what do you know about this receiving core? And A&M's doing the same thing. After, outside of Christian Kirk, you know, what do we know about this receiving core? we got a bunch of new faces. we got young talent, guys that should emerge but haven't. You know, they didn't get a ton of reps last year. It's hard to replace a Hatcher and a Morgan, uh, a Sprinkle at tight end, and just expect it to, to replicate that performance right out of the gate. Cornelius comes, starts out banged up. You look at A&M, they're rotating a bunch of guys through. Arkansas is rotating a bunch of guys through. And that's just what we see on Saturday. So what's going on Monday through Friday? I mean, how are we dividing up reps in practice? And how is our quarterback, who's a known commodity, um, is he afforded the opportunity to try, try to work with these guys consistently? Or is it just, all right, let me look out here. Okay, I mean, I know what route we're running, but who's running it for me? Oh, okay, it's this guy. You know, eventually, you know, there has to be some – uh, consistency you know you got to kind of stabilize especially that element of the passing game where the quarterbacks that's a position of trust he's got to trust his protection he's got to trust his procedure he's got to trust his play caller and right now I think at least two of those right now from a protection standpoint uh harkening back to last year because we've only played two games and last year he was you know a stunt double and this year where you're looking out there and you're going who are these guys that I'm throwing to you know, that's hard to have a quarterback who's like, I trust what's going on right now. And it shows right now the production hadn't been there. It's going to be interesting to see how he responds to a bye week and them whittling down the numbers at receiver to get more reps with a certain amount of guys rather than trying to play all of those guys, which it seems like that's been an adjustment they've made coming out of last week. The right side of their offensive line, Matt, you played in the NFL. You were an All-American at Georgia up front. The right side of that line, you have two walk-ons. One guy who's still a walk-on, a true freshman who will go on scholarship in January. Another guy who started his career as a walk-on, and nothing against walk-ons, but for an offensive line coach, a guy that has made his career on great offensive linemen. Are you puzzled by Arkansas? Not only what I just told you, but their seemingly inability to run the ball in the red zone, short yarded situations dating back to last year, and I don't think it's changed much so far this year. 
You know, I've said this for a long time, and, and I think a, no one all right, is going to take or quibble or take exception to the idea of trying to build your culture around an offensive front. But I love the fact that Arkansas, was it two years ago, they put the offensive line on the front of their media guide. That's just phenomenal stuff. You can't do that enough, right? And at the same time, um, I think that this, this offensive front historically – and, and this is even in uh, the better years where offensive production was heightened to what we're seeing right now. This offensive line typically protects the passer better than it pushed in the run game. And um, there's a lot of reasons for that, I'm sure. But I think part of it is is that, you know, size doesn't always matter. I mean, it, it really is. You, you can be huge. And, and I'm not saying that that's ultimately been the only goal. Look, every coach out there wants to miss. If you're going to miss on a recruit, on anybody that you're looking at, you want to miss in two places. You want to miss big and you want to miss fast. So if I don't know, as long as he's fast, I'll give myself a chance on this kid. And if he's a big old joker, yeah, you know, he's iffy, but he's a monster. Mm -hmm. So who knows? You know, maybe one day the, the switch flips. You know, we whittle off some of that baby fat and we replace it with muscle, and now we've got ourselves a monster. Um, at the same time, it's just when you look at the offensive front, and obviously, you know, new offensive line coach, we're in year two now, of course. Um, so the schemes have changed a little bit, but not a ton. Um it's not always been a front that I think the run, the ground game has been because of these big gaping holes. You know, you would think that just because of the sheer size of the offensive front historically, even this year, um, that that always equates to these wide open rushing lanes. It's just not the case. Another piece of it too is this: is that, and this is this is revelatory. So you want to get a pencil and write this down. That football doesn't exist in a vacuum. So you know, you look at the running game, and if you're compromised in your passing attack then defenses aren't stupid. You know, we're not going to play the pass if we're not scared of the pass. You have to threaten that defense. You, I've talked to any offensive coordinator, they'll be like, we want balance. You go to Ole Miss, they throw it 85% of the time, guaranteed, and we, and we met with them a couple of weeks ago in film room, and they're going to say, ah, you know what, we, we got to be able to run the ball. You know, we want to be balanced. We're taking what the, yeah. offense, or what the defense gives us and blah, blah, blah. And, and the reason why they're saying that is because if you can only do one thing, then that's all the defense is going to defend. And if you only have, if you only have that one thing, you got that one leg to stand on, they're going to kick it out from underneath you. I mean, you better have some dudes if you can only do one thing. And Arkansas, I think, offensively, last year it was kind of a drift, I think, away from that identity. That could have been personnel-driven. It could have been because of the difficulties on the offensive front with a lot of new faces. You know, you're placing, what, three guys up front a year ago? I just don't know this year, um, you know, you get compromised at the running back position with Raleigh going down. It's the second time. Um, you know, and you noted it earlier, this happens in a lot of different programs. But, you know, it's not always easy to just plug and play. You know, we're talking about Chase Hayden. The kid's a, he's a freshman. You know, he doesn't know what it looks like. He hadn't even entered. You know, we're talking about entering conference play now. Now it's going to get real. You know, TCU played really good defense. It's already gotten a little bit real. He only saw a series. So uh, there's a lot that goes into it. And it's more than just the big guys up front. they got to do better. There, there's no doubt about it. And the development piece of it, it is, it is surprising. Because if you're an offensive lineman, you have to consider Arkansas. You really do because you know that it's a point of emphasis. Matt Stenchcomb with us, SEC Network Analyst on the First Security Bank Hotline. With us in studio, spoke to the Northwest Arkansas Touchdown Club today. You know, uh, this is a, a Razorback defense that played pretty well. They've got some good numbers out of the first two weeks. They've given up the fewest yards through this many games in a season that they have given up uh, since 2001, okay? But they also gave up 10 of 14 third down conversions. And TCU was in third and really short for most of the day. So how do you weigh that, whether it's a good defensive performance and what you can expect maybe against A&M? Well, you know, well, here's, here's one thing is, is that every defense wants to win on first and second down. That's what, get, that's what leads to third down success. And if you can't get off the football field, you know, ask South Carolina versus Kentucky this past week. Obviously, they had a big loss at the injury position. Uh, at, uh, with Debo Samuel breaking his leg, they couldn't get off the field. You know, we've seen teams that are that aren't as good. They end up losing because they can't win on third down, and we can't get the ball. It's, it's more than just let's get their offense off the field. It's we got to get our offense back on the field. We got to, and especially if you're having a hard time establishing a rhythm offensively, the fewer cracks that you have at it, then it's that much more difficult to finally get yourself to where we can find our way into what we're going to be successful at in this game with these guys. So we've already talked about the personnel kind of turnstile that we've seen at some key spots offensively. Defensively, if you're giving up sustained drives, and I'm not talking about like just in time of possession. I'm talking about as they click off a couple of plays, 
if I can't get off the field on a third down opportunity because I didn't win on first and second, so I set myself up for failure on third, third and short, especially getting to plus territory, you might mess around, you're in four down territory, depending on how third and, third and how short, right? Um, then I'm not getting my offense back out on the field. And, and that, I think, more than anything else, ends up having a more lasting effect, even outside of the four quarters of the game that you're playing because your offense only had X number of possessions. It's like the guy that, you know, it's your four-hole hitter. How many times does he come up in the lineup? So how, how worried am I? You know, if I'm getting out, I'll see him a couple times a game, and that's it. You know, here, um, you know, if you can't get the other team off the field on third downs, then our offense, not only is it not just a scoring threat, but we're having a hard time figuring out who we are and trying to, especially in early season games, uh, what we're going to be good at for the rest of the – for the balance of our schedule. I think TCU is better than a and I like Arkansas on Saturday. You have a feel for the game? Yeah, you know, after seeing A&M last week, the fact that Arkansas has a bye week, I think, plays to their advantage. Uh, you know, A&M, uh, they've had three games. They've had three ugly games. They've played really good at times. There's no arguing that. The first half versus UCLA, and you're going, man, they have not only have they picked up where they left off a season ago, they're even better. And then you see the second two quarters, and you're going, that's unbelievable. I don't even know if it's the same team. Um, and in a lot of ways, it wasn't because of the quarterback spot. And then they had to rally versus uh, Nichols. You know, it's a 24-14 game. Uh, and they had to have – they basically had to have, a, oh, I think it was a 12 or 13-play drive in the fourth quarter to put that game away versus Nichols, his FCS opponent, um, one that should have beaten Georgia a year ago. They're giant killers. They can't do anything at their level, but they play <laughs> up, and all of a sudden they want to start dominating people. And then you've got last week versus Louisiana. Louisiana was an ugly first half. It was offensively, they had two big plays, and that was it. Um, and so, to me, the fact that Arkansas, and Arkansas has got plenty of questions, but they've also had a lot more time to try to get them addressed. Whereas, meanwhile, you know, around that A&M program, those coaches, you know, they're just sticking fingers in holes in the dam right now, just trying to figure out, all right, who's in there next? And it happened in that Louisiana game. I think the fact that Arkansas has had more time to prep to try to winnow down that wide receiver position, I think that ultimately it will play to their advantage. Matt Stinchcomb. SEC Network Analyst in studio on the First Security Bank Hotline.